Hi everyone and welcome to Pro Tools Answers where three Pro Tools experts demonstrate and elaborate on your Pro Tools questions put to the community in Avid's official Facebook support forum. Um, in uh, this week's episode, we're going to be discussing, uh, a, it's, it's not a question, it's more of a comment actually. And it's on the subject of buses. Now the comment is this, never bounce through buses that are associated to a hardware output. Always make an, a stereo bus, which we label bounce bus, and then use that exclusively for bouncing. It's a really interesting question, uh, comment that I thought was worthy of a discussion. And um, bringing the clever, as always, we have Anders Motz at Tonkraft Werk in Austria. Oh, thank you. But I'm, I'm sure the, the clever comes from uh, the next guy you're introducing. Yes, and, and myself, Dave. Thank you very much for teeing me up. <laughs> and, and we also have, by the good grace of God, Mr. Andy Hagerman, Avid's training architect, uh, all the way over in Tokyo. Hi, Andy. How you doing? <laughs> okay, so where this all comes to a head is in the bounce window uh, in your mix source. When you're bouncing your session, you can select whether you're bouncing from an internal bus whether you can select one of the buses assigned to your physical output or whether you're selecting the physical or what looks to be the physical output. But it's not quite that cut and dry, is it, Andy? No. And the first thing I would say is never forget, and everybody does at least once, that your bounce source is the output of something. So, for example, if you could go back to your bounce window, go into your bus menu there. If you were to bounce your mix bus, it would bounce the output of all the tracks that have outputs going to the mix bus. I assume, um, and this is just a guess, that your mix bus is a subgroup master, is it not? For this particular session, it's mix 7.1.2. If that's your subgroup master, if all your tracks are going to that, mm -hmm. and if you were to bounce that bus, you would not have any of the settings from that subgroup master. It's the output of the tracks. Mm -hmm. It's not the output of the destination. In the signal path, the input is before all of the inserts and sends and things. So if the signal is being printed to the hard disk from there, it's not gonna include any of that stuff. That's what you're saying, isn't it? That's what I'm saying. So that's the first thing to remember. The second thing, Dave, you were mentioning that you've got your output buses and you have your outputs. Mm -hmm. There is a difference if your workflow can capitalize on it. If you go to your output buses, they're going to stereo main out and you've got another one going to the Dolby main. And then you've got another one down there. I see going to zoom. I've got some stuff here yeah, using the uh, aux IO audio bridge. Great. Fantastic. So you have three different physical outputs to choose from, don't you? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Now, if you go to your physical output menu, you'll see the three different, there you go, right there. So you got the Dolby, you got the zoom, you got the VSX. Fantastic. That is a very common way to work, but it's not the only way that you can work. So I'm gonna share my screen. So right now, I've got a number of different tracks. Let's assume that I have some vocal tracks, I have some guitar tracks, I've got some keyboard tracks, and I've got some drum tracks, and I've got four master faders allowing me master fader control for different outputs. So I've got the, the vocals, the guitars, and these are the outputs. They're actually output buses, buses that are going to a physical output. Now, if I go into my IO setup, you'll see what I've done. What I've got are four different buses all being mapped to the same physical output. Now, this is a perfectly valid way to work, and it gives me a different kind of control over my music, but it does mean that how I bounce could be a little bit different. So I'll go into my bounce window, and now you'll see my situation's a little bit different. I've got my buses. I've got different buses. I've got a bus going to a reverb, very simple session. And then I've got four output buses, the vocals, guitars, keys, and drums all going to the same physical output. So if I was to bounce vocals, I would be bouncing just my vocal tracks, the output of all the tracks that are assigned to that output bus. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it would include any processing you have on the Vox master track, right? Mm -hmm. That's right, because it's the output of that bus. Yes. And that bus is going straight out of a physical output. But it would exclude all of the other master. It would exclude everything else. So what I could do is go here and do this. Great. And now I can bounce all my different stems. It's a very powerful way to create stems. But how do I then create a mix of everything? Well, that's when I have to go to the output. 
here, I'll go to my physical output and it's gonna be monitor left, right, which is what all of these buses are mapped to. So each one of these buses that are mapped to an output, they'll bounce only their individual food groups. Choosing the physical output will bounce absolutely every signal from any bus that's mapped to that physical output. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And thanks for, for clearing that up because uh, for me, uh, it's been like, these are the same, the same thing. They don't make any sense to me. But when you're working this way, the way that mm. you set it up, it makes total sense why you can have these two alternatives. So in terms of sound quality, there's no difference be between the outputs and the physical outputs. And I wonder if that might have been the genesis of the question. It's largely about control. Uh, yeah, but there's, uh, I mean, uh, that probably is it but uh, there's also one more thing in this question which uh, which uh, I mean uh, it's a it says a bit uh, further down this discussion it says that was recommended by DigiDesign even before they released Pro Tools HD I mean uh, I'm not sure <laughs> if that advice ever happened and it's a long time ago maybe things have changed since then yeah, I don't, I don't make, I don't lay claim to having a super, super great memory. Um, and and you're right that that if that was the case, um, that was a long time ago. I, I don't, I am not aware of any kind of recommendation today or or anywhere even in in the the modern times since the turn of the century. Um, so I think it's safe to, you know, as long as you know what you're doing signal flow wise, any of these buses will will give you identical results and there's no compromise there so there's no sonic difference or anything else uh, that we need to uh, to like beware of uh, right there right not that i'm aware of and i would like to think that i would be aware of it if there was a difference i mean uh, just looking back in the history of protos a bit uh, protos tdm came out in 1994 that's almost 30 years ago and protos hd which was mentioned here came out in 2002 so that's a 21 year old advice and things have changed in proto since then sure sure there is however i think and dave i think your system shows this real well is there's a reason why you might want to create a dedicated bounce path um because you might want to use a master fader to control your monitoring levels yeah exactly and, th and that's what i've got here I've got my sub here, my mix sub right here, and this master fader controls the main output going to speakers. If I was setting my 7.12 main bus as my bounce bus, and I had that master fader down a little bit because there's too much level coming at me, so I, I don't have overall control on my system, then that's going to be creating a bounce with a 12.9 dB cut in the signal level. And that's going to be represented in the file. Obviously, we don't want that. So I have a couple of paths up here where I can set Pro Tools to bounce to the 7.12 to tape bus. I also have one here on a stereo fold down just for sending a client away with a stereo representation of what we were doing in, in 7.1. So I can bounce from that source instead. And it means that I can adjust the output level going to the speakers differently to the output level going to the hard drive, depending on which bus I select. By the way, just as a sidebar, in your sense on that aux track, you'll see a kind of a chevron, a, a less than sign that indicates that Pro Tools is automatically down mixing. Yes. So yeah, that's cool. You know what I like about that is first of all, having prefader sends on there allows you not only to, to have that 7.1.2 track muted, but it also gives you independent volume control over both of those paths. Yes, it does. It's all about control. Obviously, it's not about the sound quality because the audio is just being taken at the bus level with all of these buses. It's not affecting anything. You know, it's all, it's all just coming out of Pro Tools and hitting the hard drive. It's not touching the physical device, is it? And then maybe that's a little bit of a confusion point for some people where it says physical output on the dialogue. Maybe they're thinking it's taking it at the interface level. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. But yeah, again, that output is the signal being sent out to the interface. Any controls that you have on the interface itself wouldn't impact that. But you're right, that may be a source of confusion. Potentially. There's another way you could do it. Um, and, and I apologize because I've got a only a stereo mix. <laughs> 
just like the other 90% of the, the world, it's fine, Andy. We'll let it pass. <laughs> so, so what I've got here is a normal workflow. So I've got all my tracks going to this aux track, which I call main sub. And then I've got that output is going out of the main mon, and then I've got the main mon master fader. So this is a very common setup. Mm -hmm. And that gives me pre-fader and post-fader control. See here, I've got my limiter on the master fader. It's very common, very, very common, right? And, and this works out completely fine for me because I've got my interface on my desk and my interface has a volume knob and I can control my monitoring level using that knob. And I do. The one thing I won't do is use my master fader to manage my monitor levels. Because as you said, Dave, any change you make to this master fader will change the file on the disc that you create when you bounce to disc. If I had no knob on my interface, or if I have a dock, which I've got over here, one of the cool things about the dock is it has a knob that says monitor. So I have monitor control from my control surface. I can click on this master fader, and if you see here at the bottom, Yukon Master. And what will happen when I click this, and I go back to it, you'll see that it's now checked. Now, any change that I make to this knob will change that master fader, which is really cool. It's a wonderful way to manage your monitoring levels. But the problem is you don't want changes in monitoring to change what's going on to your hard drive. You wanna make sure that if it's too loud and you bring it down while you're doing a bounce or anything else, that you're not creating any problems further down the road. Dave solved that problem with Sense. Let's see if there's another way that we could do it. The first thing that I'm gonna do is go to the IO setup window from the setup menu. In the bus tab, I'll create a new stereo bus, which I'll name Bounce. Then I'll go to my main sub aux track, which is the destination for all of the tracks in my session. Holding the control key on a Mac or the start key on a Windows computer, I'll click on the output assign and I'll choose my new bounce bus. And you'll see a plus in the output selector, which means that this track's output is mirrored or going to multiple destinations at the same time. In this case, if I click the button, you'll see that it's going to main mon, which is my monitoring path, and also going to the bounce bus. I'll use main mon for monitoring control using the master fader, and I'll use bounce for bouncing to disk, being completely unaffected by anything that I do with that main mon master fader. But I have one problem, right? And that's the limiter. It's on my main mon master fader track, but not a part of my bounce bus path. If I want to have that limiter applied to my bounce, there's a different way that I could do it. One way that I could do it is to create another master fader, assign it to the bounce bus, and just drag it over from the main mon master fader. But then I'm not monitoring with the limiter, so I'm not going to do that. Here's an easy way to get what I want. I'll go back to the output of the main sub, and this time I'll select new track. I'll name the new track something like pre-bounce and boom. Now the output of the main sub aux track is another aux track called pre-bounce using a bus that's also named pre-bounce. This pre-bounce track will perform a role similar to that of a master fader with one important difference. I can mirror the outputs of an aux track. I'll drag that limiter over to the pre-bounce track and I'll use the control key trick again to mirror the outputs of the pre-bounce track so it's going to the bounce bus as well as the main mon output. Problem solved. Yeah, I didn't do the mirrored outputs on, on my thing because the if 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 you're mirroring multiple output if you're mirroring outputs, the, the output fader for that track rep, the changes are represented in each of those buses, aren't they? So you lose a little bit of control. That's right. You lose a little bit of control there. Uh, so doing it with sends means that you've got, you can see both things in line, uh, which I quite like. Um, and I can see the fader level for both of the, uh, both of the bus deliveries. Yeah, it, it comes down to mm -hmm. what you want, right? If you mm -hmm. want to have single control over your levels over multiple outputs, then, then mirroring is the way to go. But if you want discrete control, like you've got, sends yeah, are completely fine. It's just two different ways to do this exact same thing. Yeah, indeed. Okay, well, we'll put a pin in there. I think we've gone as far as we can with it. Um, excellent stuff. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very much, Anders. If you Thank got you, a lot man. out of this video, uh, give us a thumbs up. Uh, it really helps the channel and helps the reach of our videos. Uh, reach other YouTube users, uh, hit the bell icon to get notified every time we release videos and subscribe to the channel, all that other stuff. Uh, but you can also head over to ProToolsAnswers.com where you can find out a little bit more over there. 
Um, and you can also find out about our inner circle as well, where you can support the channel. Uh, we're a community funded channel. And you can read about the, the tier benefits that you get for the two tiers that we offer uh, for in return for your support. And uh, hopefully you'll go and investigate that and maybe become a supporter of the channel. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. Thank you to Andy and Anders. Uh, we will see you in the next episode. My name's Dave. This is Pro Tools Answers and we are out. <laughs>